Right, I think we'll get started. It's one o'clock, but I hope we still have a few more people who are going to join us this afternoon. Uh, so good afternoon, I'll introduce myself. My name's uh, Dan Smith. I'm a respiratory trainee from Nottingham and I'm uh, one of the ESIS clinical associates. Uh, and I've got the great pleasure of working with a fantastic team, uh, including collaboration with the RCP, RCN and the patient network on this modern ward round collaborative. Uh, I've got the great pleasure of chairing today's session as well. So this is our third clinical event. We've had two fantastic events so far. And I'm sure this one's going to be equally fantastic and we've um, had a record number of people sign up to this event. During this event, we're keen to make this as interactive as possible. So as Dr. Rochford has already put in the chat box, please uh, make comments in the chat as we go along and ask questions to our expert speakers and our panel. But also we are keen to hear from you guys using a, a fancy new tool, Mentimeter, which we're going to put up on the, on the screen in, in a few seconds. Mentimeter allows everyone to feedback uh, and to make comments as we're going through the presentation. Uh, and so the best thing to do is use your smartphone that we all religiously carry around with us nowadays to scan that QR code or go to menti.com and type in this code, which we'll put in the chat box again in case uh, you missed this first few minutes of the presentation. And uh, our expert speaker, when he gets towards the end of his presentation, please start filling in some of the questions on there. And that just gives everybody an opportunity to reflect on what they've learned. Uh, and it allows us um, as the team to maybe put some questions towards Liam as well. So just to repeat that, um, in, it, after about 15, 20 minutes, use Mentimeter just to go through some of the questions we've proposed on there and that'll allow us to scope the, the, the rest of the presentation. So today we've got that this presentation is in, in two parts. I'll introduce our guest speaker, expert speaker in a second, but in the latter part of this presentation, we're gonna um, have our clinical reference group, which is our range of experts from patient representatives with Lynn Quinney on the call to doctors. We've got Dr. John D, Dr. Andrew Rochford, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Gordon Caldwell as, as well. We've got uh, occupational therapist and therapy team, I'm just looking on the list to see if uh, Rosalind Moss and Catherine Nolan are on the call. And that gives everyone on the on the call, all the attendees, the chance to ask questions to our experts. Um, but that's in our latter half of the presentation. So in our first of our, present, of our presentation, it's my great pleasure to introduce Liam Chadwick. Liam um, has got a longer history as a, an industrial engineer with 10 years of experience and works as a co or is a co-founder of One Unit, which is a, a company that supports hospitals to implement patient-centered care, especially around the ward round and around clinical process. Um, One Unit um, introduced this cyber, S-I-B-R, structured insistently bedside round program, which Liam's going to go through with you now. And, um, and the One Unit has got experience of working in many countries from Australia to America to Ireland to the UK. So I'm really excited uh, to listen to what Liam has to say. And during this presentation, like I say, please post questions. And at the end of the presentation, we'll ask Liam as many difficult questions as we possibly can. So Liam, um, I'll hand over to you if that's OK. Great. Uh, thanks, Dan. Just check is my screen sharing uh, OK there? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Thank you. Great. Um, so good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, I'd like to start off and congratulate everyone involved in getting the new Modern Ward Rounds report uh, published. I have read it cover to cover and the appendices. Um, and I'd also like to congratulate you on getting the collaborative running. Uh, no mean feat, uh, especially in the current times. So as Dan mentioned, um, just a brief introduction to me. Um, I'm Liam Chadwick, uh, PhD in uh, Human Factors Engineering and Healthcare, um, and co-founder of the US-based company called One Unit. And uh, we solely work with hospitals to improve their change of shift processes uh, for their nurses and our version of um, interdisciplinary rounds, uh, which we call cyber uh, rounds, structured interdisciplinary bedside rounds. And these nursing processes that we've developed and our cyber process reward rounds are usually encapsulated in a clinical microsystem care model uh, called an accountable care unit. So there will be several other acronyms throughout the uh, presentation that Andrew has already uh, taken the piss out of me for, but uh, apologies for that. So <clears throat> cyber started at uh, Emory University Hospital in Atlanta in uh, 2010. Um, 
And from the beginning, it was built um, for spread, not just as a, a rounds model to fit into a single environment or domain. Um, I've been involved with the model since uh, 2011, and we've worked with um, all these facilities plus others. Um, I've thrown in some of the bigger name ones here just for some brand recognition and credibility. Uh, we've success successfully uh, supported implementation of our processes on a wide variety of unit types. And I think it's important to understand the benefit of uh, application across a variety of care domains because it really enables service lines and hospitals to create a new standard of care um, with the same structure and processes working across almost every uh, care domain um, and creating that consistency between units. So that standardization and reliability is a really valuable asset because you can then start to layer on um, tweaks and changes uh, to the processes um, as you're learning what's working and what's not working. There are some tweaks and rules to follow once you um, understand the core of the processes as you transfer, and we'll go through a few of these um, in the presentation. So like we believe the great interdisciplinary rounds are possible, um, but you do need several elements uh, in place uh, for them to be great and not just mediocre. So we've learned that it's a it's a mix of structure, process, training, practice, assessment and feedback, team skills and monitoring. Uh, so appreciate that that's uh, a fairly long list, um, but that's what we've learned from the last sort of 10, 11 years um, of doing this in, in multiple continents. And that's what we've spent our time uh, building to help uh, units to implement, sustain and achieve a level of success and excellence that you know they're really happy with themselves. So if, if interdisciplinary rounds, whatever your version of them is, is the goal, um, then our experience is that you should be aiming for a punctual start uh, mid-morning every day. Um, and start times we typically see or would recommend would be 10 to 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, Cyber round is typically one hour long, depending on the patient population. That's about 15 patients in 60 minutes. Uh, if you've got a much bigger unit, you possibly got a second team. That would be a second uh, cyber hour. Um, we have seen earlier um, start times for cyber, particularly on uh, surgical units to accommodate surgeons. Um, but 10 to 11 is usually a, a good time. That gives um, the participants to have enough time to prepare their information uh, for presentation and also enough time later on in the day to actually action the plan. So uh, these swim lanes um, that I've just sort of uh, put up here are simplified representations really of a typical morning for physicians and nurses. Obviously, Allied Health would have their own set of tasks that they'd go through, um, which I'm not showing here just for uh, space saving. Um, but uh, obviously they've got their own things. So for nurses, we sort of uh, focused our efforts on a change of shift huddle process and a bedside handover process that when combined together, we sort of refer to as our, our nurses first program. So we realized a long time ago that um, nurses can get pretty much 90 plus percent of the information that they need for presentation during rounds um, or really to advocate for their patient at any point um, during the shift from the bedside handover if it's got a good structure to it. Um, the benefit of this obviously is that the nurse is then freed up to spend the morning, you know, doing the regular uh, patient care tasks rather than information prep uh, for presentation. So then on the physician side of things, we, we sort of teach and train doctors to complete a brief patient visit and exam prior to cyber. Um, that's 60 to 90 seconds per patient. Get in, frame the visit, um, complete your assessment and then defer questions politely um, that, the, that the patient has at that point uh, to the cyber round so that everyone else in the team can hear the questions and can also pitch into the answer. Uh, for teaching units, um, a teaching round can take place prior to cyber rounds. Um, there's usually enough time. We do encourage uh, units with uh, uh, junior um, physician trainees to utilize them by assigning them a patient load and expecting them to present for each of those patients during the cyber hour. Um, and this is really a great opportunity for the senior physicians to, you know, sort of teach and train um, the junior doctors on how to 
uh, present patients, um, engage patients and families in the, the conversation around their care and uh, decisions to be made. Um, also how to how they can assimilate the inputs from the other disciplines that are present and then synthesize all that information into a plan for the day and a plan for discharge. Um, so in such a scenario, if, if, if that's something that you're looking to do, um, the supervising physician tends to play sort of an oversight role and course corrects if needed. Um, and if, if this is something you're looking to do, we recommend looking at sort of the one minute preceptor model um, that's in the literature for how to tease out some of those um, questions for those junior, junior medical doctors. So uh, when I talked to the team around uh, what was what they were interested in and uh, to hear about today, um, sort of the nurses first or the, the, the sort of nurse preparation was a, a key element that they were interested in. So, so I thought I'd just spend a few minutes on that. Um, so obviously in hospitals, we sort of have a, a, a need a 24 seven continuum of care. And uh, we realized early enough that there was often a disconnect between the outgoing shift and the incoming um, shift. There was usually a drop in tempo as the oncoming nurses needed to orient themselves uh, and develop sort of their share, their mental model um, of the patients that they were caring for. So we found that there was also uh, like a lot of variability in what was being presented by nurses uh, to the oncoming nurses. Um, and this was causing a lot of sort of frustration and, and inefficiencies. So we developed a structured standardized change shift process. Um, that's a huddle. It happens at the beginning of shift. It's three to five minutes in length. Anything over five minutes is a staff meeting. Nobody wants to be in a staff meeting at the beginning or end of their shift every time. Uh, and the team huddle covers four key items. So it's what's the team composition um, for the shift uh, that's starting, uh, including any float staff that might need orientation or support uh, throughout the shift. What is the current state of the environment on the unit, such as uh, pertinent events that happened on the previous shift um, and opportunities for improvement this shift. Then patient advocacy needs, patients requiring extra emotional support, um, any safety announcements, and then it finishes off um, with a motivational quote. Um, which might sound pretty cheesy and I did not think would fly well in Australia, but it's genuinely one of the things that people uh, tend to love the most. So then this change of total process is then followed immediately um, by bedside handover. And for bedside handover, we sort of realized that there was, um, you know, three participants with three unique goals and three sort of priorities that we wanted to optimize for. So from an outgoing nurse perspective, um, they're interested in efficiency. I, I want to I safely hand over my patients so I can go home. And one of the big issues or pitfalls around this was a lack of structure uh, to keep the presentation neat, tight uh, to the pertinent information. As an incoming nurse, you're interested in efficacy. I want to get the information that I need to be able to take uh, care of my patients um, as well as I can. And a common pitfall of this that we've come to learn over the years is sort of an overstuffed um, electronic medical record report or a free for all where nurses are just presenting whatever they feel um, is relevant. And then from a patient perspective, the patients are interested obviously in, in, in engagement, you know, lots of evidence um, highlighting patients' desire for engagement in their care. Um, and perhaps this is more of a, a North American sort of issue that we've encountered, but We've had several units um, who have had consultants in who have pushed a, a highly scripted sort of customer service type you know, bedside handover process that was really neglecting the, the medical side of the handover. So we don't we don't script anything um, as part of our processes. We, we think that's a bit of an insult to staff, it just stifles them and their critical thinking. Um, so we prefer, we prefer to just provide the prompts of the items that they need to cover and let them sort of fill in the colors themselves um, of the painting. So typically we'd see like two of these um, sort of three legs of the stool being um, addressed, but usually at the, at, the, at the expense of the third. So our bedside handover report uses a structured format um, and we've developed it really as like a skilled competency for nurses to sort of um, level up to. Um, so we identified over time high performance criteria that are used for codified assessment um, and performance feedback to individuals. Um, to verify their, their proficiency in the bedside handover process. Uh, we have I've identified nine criteria for like a high quality bedside handover. Um, and if you demonstrate as a nurse eight of these nine criteria for three patients, um, you sort of become nurses first verified in your bedside handover process, sort of 
a recognition that you're, you know, you're really knocking this out of the park. So our handover form uses a NISPAR format. It is paper based. You could um, use an electronic version, but I will say there is something uh, it, it sort of a tangible handover paper based form creates an accountability moment because between that offgoing nurse and that oncoming nurse to make sure that that information is is as up to date as possible. Um, it takes about one to three minutes per patient um, and again ensures that the oncoming nurse is 90 plus percent of the information that they need for advocating for their patients at any point during the shift. So it, whether it's IDRs, interdisciplinary rounds or a special consult that's come onto the unit to examine the patient. If there is a MET a medical emergency team or rapid response team call for that patient or just family queries, the information's on the form, the report and can be easily um, presented at any point in time. And if that bedside nurse is away temporarily uh, from the bedside, a colleague can easily stand in, take the form and present on their behalf. So it does need to be customized uh, to each unit um, to ensure that only the relevant information is shared forward and that the common hospital acquired conditions um, for the patient population are being addressed uh, through the inclusion um, of a, a quality safety checklist. So it's at the bedside um, and it's really engaging patient friendly language when you get them involved in their own care. Um, and it's also the point of time each morning when the outgoing nurse, oncoming nurse and patient will discuss the patient's goal for the day. And that's a really important piece of information that we, we sort of build into our uh, cyber rounds as well, which we'll come to later. So I've sort of put some screenshots in here of the, of the reports um, and uh, you can have a look at these in more depth yourselves. The, the slides will be available after, um, after the presentation, so I won't really go through them now. Um, but just to sort of highlight um, sort of the improvements that you can see from just doing like a really good change of shift um, process and bedside handover um, on a unit. So I mentioned sort of the high performance behaviors that we've identified. So this is data from a, a hospital that we were working with from one of their units. Um, and the data shows um, results from their US based national patient experience survey scores um, for the month prior to starting implementation and the month after they completed the sort of bedside handover verification process. Um, they actually got it all done in a month. They launched the, the huddle process, they launched the handover process, they verified their, their nursing staff on the unit um, all within the same month. Um, so essentially our gray bar here and our green bar is just showing uh, the pre-month and then the, the, the following month after they'd um, implemented everything. So this, this unit was um, actually really happy with their existing bedside handover form and process. Uh, we were working with seven units in this hospital concurrently and, and this, this unit in particular um, pushed back the most on changing their form as they had already done a lot of work to improve it, um, but they sort of agreed to give it a go. And um, once they sort of saw the, 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 the official results from this uh, HCAP survey, they, and, and they knew themselves anyway that it was going much better, they were sort of happy to proceed um, with our version. But, uh, you know, significant jump here from nurses, nurses listened carefully to you from the third percentile nationally to the 81st percentile nationally um, and rate the hospital from the first percentile to the 89th percentile. So that's sort of how we how we upskill and help uh, the bedside nurses to prepare for um, interdisciplinary rounds, uh, moving into sort of what do uh, cyber rounds look like? Um, so cyber is our version of interdisciplinary rounds, which I've said already, um, and it's specifically designed to enable teams to round on 15 or so patients in 60 minutes, which sounds very fast, but when the team is up and running well with it, it doesn't actually feel that pacey at all. So it is six steps that we'll go through um, in a minute, but I just sort of wanted to highlight that. So the cyber is designed to create an opportunity to exchange updates um, between the different uh, team members and then to collaboratively cross check that information as well. So designed into it is an understanding that we need to discover, um, you know, sort of any closely held misinformation that a team member might have that might be impacting the plan of care, or plan for discharge. And then we want to proactively manage those known common hospital acquired conditions um, through our quality safety checklist that are relevant to um, our patient population. 
Our goal is to create a shared plan of care and for discharge and the common ground that we need as a team to be able to sort of divide and conquer after the round. Um, and we also kind of want to develop a, a set of high performance individual skills and team skills uh, that will help us to be resilient and sort of anti-fragile when things get pressured and strained um, in our day, which happens so, so frequently. So on paper, th this is really what cyber looks like. Um, this is what we refer to as the cyber diagram. It's got six steps. It is very structured. We don't think that's a bad thing. We actually think it's a, it's a great um, point to leverage um, as part of rounds. Um, so by having the same structure uh, and the same content in the same order reduces the cognitive load on everyone present. Once you're up to speed, once you've learned the, the order that things are presented in, when something is presented that's an abnormality or a key point, it stands out more and draws your attention as an item that needs to be addressed. The structure also builds familiarity and expectations. So with all, with, with all the structure and uh, ensuring everything is discussed um, regularly, we're building that common ground between the team members and the patient and the family about what is happening for, the, for them and what the plan of care and the plan for discharge is. So we start cyber with our lead physician um, who introduced the team say the name of the nurse and usually the roles of the other team members that are present. They'll then move into updating the hospital course or reviewing the active problems and the response to treatment um, and discuss any integral test results and consultant inputs. Uh, and then we've got an update of the current status. So overnight events, our patient subjective goal for the day. Uh, we have our vital signs and pain control and our fluid and food intake, um, mental status and functional status. These are report by deviation, ideally. So only report them um, if there's an abnormality to present, but you do have to present the patient's objective goal for the day. And then step four from our bedside nurse here is our quality safety checklist, which again gets customized to the, the, the needs of our patient population. Typical items, catheters, central lines, VTE prevention, glycemic control, pressure ulcer and stage, fall risk and prevention. We do encourage um, any of the items in step four to be backed by nurse driven protocols um, so that the nurses themselves can evaluate the patient, work through the algorithm, do their critical thinking and present that critical thinking as part of the, the round. Oh, yeah, actually, I forgot 2C here. At 2C, sorry, the uh, physician will cross check with the patient and family. Um, and, the, and then hand over to the nurse. So the cross check would be something along the lines of Mrs. Williams, does that sound right to you? Is there anything I missed? And most of the time they'll say, no, that sounds about right. But it's, it's, it's really more of an invitation to the patient and the family to get involved in the conversation. Um, and it's, it's a subtle cue, but it's one that they pick up on. So back to our nursing update here, steps three and four. Um, these match over to the bedside handover process that we've laid down on the units that the nurses are going through at each change of shift. Um, or at a minimum, if you're not doing that sort of standardized bedside handover process, you can just use a, a cyber nurse prep sheet um, that matches up to the items and has a column for each of the patients that the, that the nurse has that they can prep themselves um, ahead of cyber. Step five then is um, inviting the inputs from the other disciplines present. Um, and Obviously, the other disciplines present will be resource dependent for each unit. Um, we've sort of refined the inputs for what the most common uh, additional staff that might be available. Um, so our pharmacists will usually uh, speak to the discre discrepancies to resolve antimicrobials to narrow um, and IV to PO switches. Uh, a social worker will speak to the discharge plan and the needs and complex supports the estimated date of discharge from their perspective um, and the next site of care. Obviously there are more, but just sort of for the prevalence of time here. Um, and then a role that we've sort of established over the years um, that most people probably wouldn't think about is the role that we call the cyber rounds manager. And the cyber rounds managers sets the schedule for the round earlier on in the morning and shares that schedule with all of the nurses on the unit and usually sticks it up at the nurses station so that any of the allied health can see, OK, Mrs. Williams is going to be at the top of the hour. Um, I want to be there for that. 
Mr. Smith is going to be at about 20 past 10, so I'll be back for that one, and allows them to optimise um, their participation in the round. Uh, they can also fill the role of uh, extricating the team uh, from the bedside if things are starting to drag on a little, just to remind them to keep on time. So after step five, um, it comes back to the lead physician then, um, who sort of synthesize and bring it all together into an interdisciplinary plan of care. So they'll address each of the items raised by each of the team members as they've discussed them. Um, and that's, you know, to develop our interdisciplinary plan of care. That will help us overcome any clinical inertia, make sure we're activating on any of the risk dates that have been identified. Um, and it will finish off with assigning responsibilities or ideally having the team members volunteer for any items that they can contribute to themselves. If the patient needs to be mobilized a little bit more, maybe the, the nurse can offer up some time on that. Maybe the physician can offer up some time to help the, unit, uh, the patient mobilize around the unit. So that's sort of cyber as a six step process. I will, you might've been looking at the times here and going, ooh, that's, that's pretty brief and that's pretty quick. Um, and I will just point out that the times are sort of indicative and are not, um, you know, military timing. So on average, cybers will take about three and a half minutes, um, but do not go in there with the stopwatch. And when it hits three minutes, call time and tell everyone they've got to get out. Over the course of an hour, you'll have some long ones, you'll have some, some short ones. It will average out between three and three and a half minutes. So upskilling staff to sort of be able to deliver a high quality IDRs. Um, we believe that most attempts to introduce IDRs fail for four main reasons. Um, the first one is a lack of structure, which we sort of discussed in relation to the cyber protocol. And, and hopefully you're seeing the benefits of having a similar structure. Um, the second is really that individual skills matter a lot. Um, so training stakeholder groups how to prepare efficiently um, and deliver their content eloquently uh, and with the critical thinking is a skill that is often given too little emphasis. Uh, and it's a common reason for failure in our experience. So we've established a, a set of high performance behaviors um, for physicians, nurses, and allied health, 10 for physicians, 10 for nurses, and 10 for allied health, that we evaluate the staff at an individual level on um, and use that to provide objective, codified, specific feedback on their performance. Uh, the third item then is team skills matter even more. So we teach around uh, advanced team skills like shared mental models, situation awareness, resilience, orchestration, clinical inertia, really to ensure that the team as a whole can support an underperforming individual, whether that's an in, a new individual or someone who's just having a bad day, that they can keep everything going at a high level. And then the fourth item um, is performance monitoring. So monitoring is really vital to ensure that variation doesn't creep into the process and start to undermine the whole effort. Um, you can't just set rounds up and then forget about them. They'll just normalize to, to the baseline. So we've seen lots of units that that's happened to. Um, so we've developed sort of an efficient method for digitally tracking and reporting cyber performance um, and feeding that then into daily, weekly, quarterly reports um, and provides sort of unit and team level dashboards that can help unit leaders to proactively manage any issues that might be arising. Um, I grade out most of the slide um, key points really are that uh, cyber quantity you have to be getting to enough patients uh, with enough quality to really make an impact on, on the unit outcomes. Um, and here's just a quote from a physician colleague that we've, we've worked with for, for a couple of years. So he said, cyber itself is not magic. Really good cyber is not really magic either, but really good cyber is very, very valuable. Getting people in a room and just going through a checklist and going through the script is not valuable at all. It needs to be high quality. And you need the leaders, both informal and formal, to be there to see when it goes off the rails to readjust and recalibrate. So I thought I'd just pop up some sort of outcomes that we've seen on, on one unit again. Um, so again, these are the, the National Patient Satisfaction Survey scores from North America, percentile scores again. Um, so this is post-implementation of cyber and after they had 
um, uh, sort of cyber certified uh, the individuals as being competent in the process. Um, so we can see huge jumps again in, in items like communication with nurses, uh, response of the hospital staff, communication around medications, discharge information, care transitions. So it can cover off like the one intervention can actually cover off a lot of different, a lot of different elements. Um, so just some of the common failure modes that we've encountered are things that like if, if I was putting a project plan together around IDRs, I think you should be spending some time considering. I've broken these out into three different categories, um, color coded, how to train, how to coach and certify and how to manage. And was just up here in the top right hand corner, we have one from all three. Uh, main one really is that the cyber, cyber team members are lacking a full shared mental model of who says what, when, and in what sequence, or are arriving to cyber not fully prepared. The, the, one of the cardinal sins of, of IDRs is that thou shalt not force another team member to watch me do my primary data gathering. That's, that's um, a lot of person minutes that are lopping off the clock if you're there doing your primary data gathering and not ready to present. Uh, cyber team members lacking cyber skills, such that others don't experience cyber as a highly valuable use of time. That will start to undermine the process and erode enthusiasm and engagement. And similar again, failure to support and manage frontline performance, resulting in variable cyber and eroding belief and satisfaction of enthusiastic team members. Several more here that you can um, spend your time looking at um, later on with the slide set. So, uh, been Pretty, pretty swift and efficient so far. Um, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna show a video um, of a, an actual cyber from a hospital. Um, just remind you of the Menti uh, details and to post some of your questions. Uh, and perhaps while you're watching the video um, on Menti, you could um, think about, you know, think of the six step communication protocol that we went through. The, Doctor does the first two steps, nurse does the second two steps, allied health, and then synthesis by the doctor. Sort of evaluate how this team is are, are doing with the six step communication protocol. Think about the interaction between the staff and the patient uh, and the staff with each other. Uh, notice things like uh, language, um, body language, et cetera, et cetera. You know me, I'm Marianne, I'm one of the junior doctors on the team looking after you. And you know your nurse here, Gina. She's all right, that's good to hear. And this is the rest of your team here today. So just to recap for everybody here, you came in with a bit of an infection on your chest. A bigger one. <laughs> a big one. And you weren't very well at all. No, so we've given you some antibiotics and lots of puffers and things to try and improve your breathing. And we've got it to the stage that we're going to get you to a, to a hostel, just getting all that sorted out. That's lovely to hear. And now, Jenna, your nurse is going to tell us about how you've been overnight. Yeah, so Bruce, I know you know our, our goal for today, as we discussed this morning, was to get up and start walking a little bit more, which you've been doing, and I've been seeing you sort of walking around a little bit more on the ward, which is fantastic. Um, I know your breathing's improving a little bit, and now you're having the inhalers instead of the nebulizers, so that's been really good, just to see it's using those really well. Um, your observations have all been great, so we're happy with everything there um, this morning, which has been really good. And you don't have any more drips in your arms anymore or no, catheters, no, so that's right. Um, <laughs> it's been voiding really well and valves have been open, so we're not worried about anything there. You've got a good appetite too. Um, you're still on the heparin, so do you remember that little needle that I gave you this morning? Yeah. In your tummy? Yeah, that one in the tummy, so that one there to prevent those blood clots and things. You've been receiving that. Um, and you've also, yeah, just, you know, skin integrity is good. It's been, um, yeah, had a pretty good morning and we're just sort of a, only a, a sort of a slight pause risk. We're just a bit of standby, I suppose, when um, Bruce is walking around. But otherwise, we're really happy with your improvement. So that's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Bruce, we'll get you off to Fancy Western Lodge on Monday. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me exactly where that is? Yes, behind Guantanamo. Oh, right. Remember? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, it's right on the same block. Oh, yeah, but right behind in the hospital. 
That's a good spot. I've got a very good friend. I know you've been. Oh. <laughs> and it's a good spot. Mrs. Ripperger. For her, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Evelina. Uh, she, 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 she and I have been great friends for 30 years. Oh. But so Arthur Ripper was a yeah. bit of a, a scoundrel. He wouldn't let her learn. He wouldn't let her learn to drive a car. That's mm. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be nice and easy for her to get there. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Really good. All right. I think that's everyone, yeah. Bruce. Thank you very much. That's all right. We just Thank have to you, re recap your plan for the day. <laughs> We're going to keep getting you up and mobilising you around, and we'll just wait for your hostel um, oh, placement yeah. to come yeah. up. Yeah, well, I'll, I'm, I'm prepared to operate in any way <laughs> with you. <laughs> That's good. Because I know your, your help would be. Oh, we're all here to help you, Bruce. Yeah. You've been lovely to take care of. Thank you. That's all right, mate. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> See you later. All right. So, you know, I'll just sort of highlight a couple of things. It's not a particularly complex patient. I'm well aware of that. Um, but there's a lot that can be learned from Bruce and about Bruce just from the three and a half minutes that that was happening. I mean, Bruce sort of uh, took over and spoke for about a minute of that, um, which might seem like a little bit long, a little bit of a waste of time. But if you think about it in terms of what's Bruce's understanding of where he's being discharged to, you got to assume that that's pretty high. Bruce's um, cognitive function is pretty high. If you look at Bruce, his you know, sort of ADLs are probably pretty, pretty high as well. I mean, he's sitting here wearing a cravat. He's nicely dressed. He's ready to sort of, um, he's engaged with the team. Um, if we, if we look back here at, um, uh, yeah, if we look back here, as Jenna was going through her inputs, she's using her bedside handover report that she's got prepared. Um, if we look at Marianne, um, he's a, a junior doc four weeks uh, into her position as a junior doc. Um, she's getting down to eye level with Bruce, really engaging him. Um, Jenna actually is also a grad nurse. This is week four of her um, professional career, I guess. Um, they transitioned fluidly over between each other and then over to Marg here, who's the discharge coordinator, um, who sort of stepped in uh, fluidly knowing the, uh, the sequence of everything. Um, and then at the very end here, we uh, we actually have, well, you notice that Bruce at one point sort of started to thank everybody before uh, Marianne had actually summarized everything and given the plan for the day. Um, and she draws Bruce's attention back to her by putting her hand on her shoulder and getting back down to eye level. Um, but Bruce was saying thank you to the doctor, who's the senior physician, uh, who was standing over here. Um, he was enjoying himself so much that he was supposed to be updating the whiteboard, um, but forgot to do that. And you can see him grabbing a pen from one of his colleagues here, and uh, he actually just pretends to update the whiteboard <laughs> uh, on video. Um, so I think if you look at it, there's a lot of information that was shared. Uh, Jenna went through the, the quality safety checklist, did her updates quite well. A lot of information about the discharge, expected date of discharge, etc. So just to sort of very quickly uh, finish off, um, Andrew and Dan are kind of interested in some of the reports or data that we have. So just one set of data here, two, two items from a, a Yale um, hospital um, so a study, so around inter interprofessional uh, communication. So big jumps in uh, nurses' uh, perceptions of interprofessional communication pre and post, um, and the same for residents. Um, another facility, teamwork scores, from a nursing perspective, physicians speak face to face with me daily, massive jump. Uh, from a physician perspective, nurses prepared to discuss the patient, significant jump again. So I'll leave this slide up. It's a, sort of a compilation of, of published data and, uh, that you can have a look at. Um, all the slides supporting this are in the deck. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, if, yeah, Dan. Thank you so much, Liam. Uh, a fantastic presentation and the video brought it all together to kind of give it real um, kind of
kind of clinical real reality of how your different ideas and all those 650 different acronyms that you described and abbreviations <laughs> that I'm just about getting my head around. I've been making notes. But no, that the, the video, especially the way that the nurse and the GU doctor directed their feedback directly to the patient in patient level language, I think was, was really interesting. We're just going to go to the Mentimeter that people have been really um, kindly filling in at, while we've been going through this presentation. And that will maybe stimulate a few questions for people. Please put those questions in the chat box. Uh, Benjamin Brown, Gordon and John Dean, you've already put, put some questions in that we're going to direct to Liam. Uh, and then we'll come over to our clinical reference group as well to give their reflections on today and ask them some questions. So you've still got a little bit of time to go to menti.com, enter that code 6303 or go to your camera on your uh, smartphone uh, and uh, scan that QR code. So the information for that is in the chat box. So we'll move on to the first slide. Uh, the first question, please, Crystal, for Menti. And this question is, what stood out most in Liam's presentation? And this is using a fancy word cloud here. So um, standardization, structured nurse handover, clear goals and clear roles, shared mental models. I'm going to go back to you, Liam. Is that the kind of things that you wanted people to take out of the uh, the cyber and the IDR model? Yeah, I'm happy with that, Stan. You've done a good job today, Liam. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and then on to the next one, Crystal, please. And what things shown in the presentation are you already doing on your ward? So uh, we have a colleague here that they've already defining their clear roles and they've already put a formal structure, but it's not reliable. And Liam, you, you mentioned a few kind of hints and tips there, didn't you, in your presentation about why um, the reliability or the uh, success of this, um, these, these processes might fall down. Is there anything you want to pick up on those comments? Yeah, I think um, uh, nailing down the important pieces of information that uh, you would like to hear from your colleagues to help you progress care and um, work towards that discharge and to hear from them what information they would like you to present, um, I think is a really worthwhile activity that any unit can benefit from. And that will really help you to zone in on the specific items for each team member to bring and prepared to the interactions. Thank you, Liam. And then we'll move on to our last question on Menti, please, Crystal. So what three things for this presentation could you implement on your ward? So we've got further categorization of rounds, including other members of the team in a debrief, and handover checklist, and one minute preceptor model investment, and more time and effort in building team skills. And handovers and checklists within different areas of the ward round. A, a, a big thing, is that because of your human factors background, Liam, or is it part was it part of the initial idea behind the accountable care units and the and cyber? Yeah, uh, interesting story. I mean, cyber sort of originated. Um, Dr. Jason Stein, who sort of founded the model at uh, Emory, they were actually working on a, a VTE pro, uh, prophylaxis project. Uh, sounds familiar, I'm sure. Um, and the units that they had developed, sort of a, a real time data display dashboard for the units at the hospital. And they assumed that presenting the data on a dashboard, then the team members would just look at who didn't have prophylaxis and they you know, prescribe VTE prophylaxis. But in reality, it was only the units that were sort of doing some version of team rounds that were actually taking the information, making sure, you know, alerting it to the different team members and making sure that there is a, an order being placed into the medical record that was then being acted on. And that sort of got them thinking around, well, what can we do around team structure? and Equally, if I'm working on VTE prophylaxis and one of my colleagues is working on falls and someone else is working on pressure ulcers or whatever the 10, 11, 12 known common hospital acquired conditions are, how could we break those into our daily rounds process so that we can, you know, proactively manage those each day? And that's just sort of turned into a quality safety checklist. Excellent. OK, thank you, Liam. Thank you. And thank you everybody who has um, has put their comments on Mentimeter. We're going to go to a bit of a QA and a now. I'm going to put a couple of questions to Liam and then I'm going to ask uh, if it's OK, each member of our clinical reference group to introduce themselves, maybe um, give some thoughts on Liam's presentation and how they think it would either impact their care as a patient or their work as a, a physio, a pharmacist or a doctor. Uh, and also, um, if you put a question in, such as John Dean, put a question in the chat box, uh, we we'll can ask you to directly uh, direct your question to Liam. Liam's gone very black on my screen, just suddenly disappeared. I don't know if that's true of everybody else's. First question, Liam, for you is um, one that um, Benjamin Brown has put on, which is when does an examination of the patient take place? And I 
from, from memory of your video, people gain their information or gather their information earlier. So the doctors and nurses, I assume, examine their patients earlier and then presented at the cyber round. Is that right? Does that cause yeah. repetition though, in, in their care? Yeah, that, that's correct. So we, yeah, as I said, sort of the, the cardinal rule is to come to cyber prepared. So the physicians would do that 60 to 90 second um, pre-round on the patients where they would do their physical exam and assessment. Um, and we teach it in such a way that it does stick to a 60 to 90, 90 second um, interaction. Um, and really once the patients, you know, on the first day that they're in the unit, they probably won't get cyber. They'll get cyber from day two plus, um, but they'll see cyber happening. They'll have an idea. It'll be, they'll be oriented to the cyber process by the bedside nurses um, from day one. Um, and then from day two, they'll start to get cyber. Um, but they, they sort of learn pretty quickly that the, the, the team actually will come around between 10 and 11. I will get my questions answered. I can have my, my wife, my husband, my daughter here, and they can hear what the team are saying. They can hear what the plan of care is. Um, so that's sort of how it ends up functionally working. Excellent. Thank you, Liam. And one more question before we go to our clinical reference group was, um, a couple of the examples you described are either Australian or, or from the United States. Um, do they have different patient to uh, clinician ratios and how, how does the workforce differ? Um, is it, it feels like um, there might be a little bit of repetition if you're going back as a doctor two or three times to a patient. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you, you, yes, you would do a pre-round and you would do cyber. And unless there are complicated or, you know, goals of care conversations that need to happen, um, with a, a patient and family, you probably don't need to go back to the patient a third time during the day. Um, what are the what are the sort of differences between Australia and and America and Canada around uh, patient ratios and things? In a, in America, it's they're often hospitalist led units, so the physicians are unit based or ward ward based or oriented. They would have. 18, 20 patients probably on the on the unit. Um, they would cyber on 14, 15 patients during the cyber hour. Um, the nurses, depending on region, would have a nurse to patient ratio of, and obviously depend on the acuity of care, but on an acute medical unit, one to four um, nurse to patient. Um, but we have also seen one to seven and one to eight uh, with some hospitals in New York. Um, and in Australia, they tend to be sort of um, uh, specialist units like oncology units or, or units. Um, that, that unit actually that I showed the video from um, is a little bit rural in New South Wales in Australia. It's a tertiary care facility, but um, the, there's about five physicians who sort of pool together and they work one week in a hospital as the sort of lead physician for the unit. And then they do four weeks of uh, their community um, community care and, and outpatient clinics. And they actually found that they were much more efficient and able to do much more work in the community by not having to then field questions um, for the time that they were not in the hospital. Excellent. OK, thank you, Liam. We're going to go to our, our clinical reference group, if that's OK, next. And um, we're delighted that, uh, that many members of the clinical reference group have been able to uh, attend today. Uh, this clinical reference group attend each of our clinical events to give their expert uh, opinion and advice. Uh, and also they help shape our modern world around collaborative as well. And um, so if I go to each of you individually, please introduce yourself if that's okay. And if you have any reflections on what you've heard today, or if you'd like to put the questions that you've put in the chat box directly to Liam, that'd be great. Um, so first of all, do you mind if I come to, to, to Lynn Quinney first, if that's okay? That's okay, thanks Dan. I'm Lynn Quinney. I'm um, a member of the Patient and Care Network of the Royal College of Physicians. Um, really interesting presentation and I'm very impressed by what I've seen and I think a lot of my colleagues in the uh, patient care network would, would similarly be because of the very explicit um, emphasis on the involvement of patients and carers, families and that's one of the things that clearly matters a lot to, um, to, 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 to patients. Um, I, I, I think Early on, I was um, sort of um, thinking through, is this going to feel a bit 
like being on a conveyor belt as a patient. That's 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 what I was thinking. How do how do you avoid that? Com what I call the conveyor belt effect. And I think Liam very um, very adequately answered that actually when he talked about um, the importance of individual um, and team skills and uh, I suppose a flexibility of approach. Um, so. And, and again, the, the idea that, you know, on average, it's going to take um, sort of three and a half to four minutes. I thought if if it became a little bit too much like right time's up, folks, time to move on, then clearly that's not going to be very helpful to, to, to patients and their families. But I liked the fact that um, the emphasis that you put, Liam, on, on the fact that there does need to be that sort of um, uh, well, a individual approach and the, the, the need to recognise that some people will take less than the three and a half minutes, some people are going to take more than that. So um, and as, as an ex NHS trainer myself, I would, I, I'd like to endorse the point about um, the importance of training and coaching, I think, because I think I've seen too many initiatives introduced in the NHS where people have been put through um, uh, some kind of process and expected to just get on with it. And actually, it does need, uh, um, I think, attention on an ongoing basis, CPD, um, a, a, a coaching approach on an ongoing basis. And that what I really liked as well was the emphasis on the team, the involvement of the team and really embedding some some team skills. So, um, yes, overall, I, I, I think from a patient care perspective, um, this looks like very good news. So thank you very much. Well, no, thank you for your feedback there, Linda. That's, that's great. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I come to Gordon Caldwell next? Gordon, thank you so much for uh, your enthusiasm and all the information you're putting in the chat box as well. Do you mind introducing yourself and giving some early reflections? And yeah, I'm Gordon Caldwell. I'm a consultant physician and clinical lead up in Oban Hospital. I used to work in Worthing down on the south coast. Uh, before I came up to Oban and been interested in war drone processes since at least 2004. And I remember reading Jason Stein's work and thinking this just makes so much sense to try and create a functional unit that's based on the ward, um, the shared mental models, but it's all meant to be about the patient. So just seeing that video clip where you can see how it works. And most patients, I think, on war drones are very passive. They're not engaged. They're not talking and they're certainly not smiling on war drones. So I think to, to see how it all gelled together to produce those shared mental models, that it could be efficient and personal at the same time and thorough with the active, with the emphasis on active patient safety checking as well. Um, I just I suspect that you know one of the questions I wanted to ask Liam was how much backing do you need from the chief executive, the medical director and the director of nursing to see this through? Because just trying to put this into place on your own ward is probably not going to work unless you've got that real senior backing within the organisation. Thank you. Yeah, Liam, over to you. Sorry, Teams crashed and I just <laughs> I missed the last couple of minutes. Um, so sorry, Lynn, if you had a question, I really apologise. I, I, I missed most of what you said, um, uh, but I'd love to talk to you more. Uh, Gordon, uh, senior nurse executive and senior physician buy-in. We have seen it come from both ends. So we've seen unit led implementations where you have a physician who spends a lot of their time on the unit and a nurse manager who actively wants to improve care. And you can actually make a lot of progress with that. It's obviously much better if you can get a service line director, um, a chief medical officer, chief nursing officer on board to, to back you. Um, and the benefits of that is that they can also hold you accountable to the uh, improvements that you're that you're trying to achieve. So one of the things that we would um, sort of encourage people to set up is a quarterly reporting presentation between the unit leaders, which would be a, a unit nurse leader and a physician co-lead to the hospital executive uh, every quarter just to present what they've been working on, present the outcomes they're seeing, what their plan is for the next three months and what sort of barriers they're experiencing, whether it's structural, data, whatever it is that they can have a conversation about those. 
Yeah, excellent. Thank, thank you, you for your comments, Gordon, and thank, thanks, Liam, for your detailed answer. I was going to come to uh, to Lauren next to hear from the OT and the MDT uh, perspective. She just had to jump off the call, unfortunately. So I was going to come to, to David Campbell, if that's OK. David, we talked a lot about uh, Nurses First today and, uh, and doctors. From the MDT, from the pharmacist's opinion, how did you find the, the presentation today? And your, what's your initial feedback? Although David as well has had to go, <laughs> so we've also missed David. So Mike, I've gone round in the, the patient, the, the clinical efforts group in the, in the wrong order. So I must last but definitely not least, uh, I'm going to come to Dr John Dean from the Royal College of Physicians. John, um, again, do you mind introducing yourself? And you, you've put some really good questions in the chat box, which I've purposely not um, asked to allow you to, um, to put them to, towards Liam. And you sat there in the dark, John. Are you um, moonlighting as a radiologist at the moment? <laughs> I don't know why it's uh, it's quite so dark, but I hope I hope people can see me. It's just uh, the way the lighting's picking up. Um, so I'm John Dean. Uh, I'm a physician in East uh, Lancashire in the northwest of England, uh, and I'm also clinical director of quality improvement uh, and patient safety and co-chair the modern ward rounds uh, uh, working group. Uh, uh, and and we drew a lot of information from uh, 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 Unit One and and their work. Um, which uh, I think uh, has been important. Um, I was very struck by uh, the presentation, uh, particularly um, the importance of the culture that you need to create in the unit in order for uh, it to work in that cohesive way. Um, I was also quite struck by the daily goals and the importance of that. Uh, that's something that I I'm certainly going to talk to tomorrow, to the team tomorrow on the ward about. Uh, and how we can introduce that in a more structured way. I absolutely think that the shift handover into the multidisciplinary decision making is key. And I also think that that preparation by individual members of the team before the joint working. So you're not data mining when you come together. You're, you're making sense of the data it, it is key. And, and we've obviously emphasised that in the modern ward rounds report. But the importance of a, of a consistent staffing with the skills on the unit is going to be fundamental to this. And this is one of the challenges I think we have in the NHS at the moment. Multidisciplinary, consistent staff with the skills to work in a structured way. And that's why it, I think it's going to have to be delivered across a, across a, uh, you know, a, a hospital or, or at least the discipline in that, you know, that the medicine or surgery or whatever in that hospital rather than an individual unit because staff will be moving around. I was particularly interested, Liam, in the concept of clinical inertia, something I've not particularly come across before, but I uh, wonder if you've got a quick comment on that. Yeah, clinical inertia, the failure to up titrate um, treatment of a patient uh, when clinical indicators are met. Um, so. A lot of the times, you you know, we kind of hear you'll see staff and sort of that quote I referenced, you know, reading through the checklist is not enough. The patient does not have VTE prophylaxis. Actually, the patient should have VTE prophylaxis. Dear doctor, can you put in an order for VTE prophylaxis for this patient? And by the end of the, the interaction, the doctor is saying, you know, summing up and saying, and I'm going to put in an order for the VTE prophylaxis once the round is over and you can action that. That is really overcoming, that is identifying and mitigating that risk state for that patient and ensuring that happens every day across multiple factors. Yeah, so it's, it, so it's, it's that action orientated, again, culture of the unit. It's not just problem identifying, but actually what are you going to do about and taking ownership for that at the different team members level. The other question I put in the chat was around the numbers. And I think you answered that, that, that later on. And I think it was interesting that your day one received it today. Eight patients on my ward were new to the ward. We saw them first. There were your complex discussion interaction, quite a lot of data mining that needed senior and junior input. Uh, but certainly now we've got the clear plan. I can see how we could follow it uh, through with more of a cyber approach. So thank you very much. Thanks, John. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we tend to, we wouldn't tend to cyber on patients first day on a unit until they've been properly worked up. 
Well, thank you all and thank you to our clinical reference group. And I particularly like, John, you picked up on handover as a as a place of adding value. And all, we're always taught, especially junior doctors, is, it's a risky time for a patient handing over from one information to the other. So it's greatly in that your programme actually allows that to add value to the patient care. We're close to finishing, so I'm going to hand over to the last member of the clinical reference group that's got a grand total of 30 seconds to give his opinion. Um, but it's Dr. Andrew Rochford, who's one of our team. So I'll let Andy have the last word for the programme. Uh, for today, but thank you everybody for attending. Over to you, Andy. Uh, Dan, thank you. That's very kind, and thank you everyone for for joining today. Thank you particularly to Liam for your presentation. Um, and just to pick up on Dan's last point, of course, our next clinical learning events uh, will be on handover, hospital at night, and handover these high areas of, of, of pressure. I, I would like everyone to just reflect on today's. Uh, uh, presentation. There's loads to be taken out uh, and away from it. It will be available on our futures platform from a personal perspective and particularly in light of the junior doctors changing last week. I, I'm, I'm really taken with the idea of um, collective competence and investing time and effort in the new members of staff as they come onto the wards and, and leading by example. Um, I put into the, the chat box, I think the energy and enthusiasm within the members of the collaborative uh, provides us with a great opportunity to implement some, most, if not all of cyber on, on our wards, which we know will improve patient safety and patient outcomes. So thank you all very much for your continued uh, commitment and energy to the program. We look forward to seeing you um, next month. We've got a midpoint appraisal, if you like, this uh, the shared learning uh, event, uh, as well as our next clinical learning event. Thank you all once again. Have a good afternoon, and, and I hope it, the weather's nicer than it is in London for everyone at the moment. It's a bit wet and miserable here. Take care, everyone, and see you next time. Bye now. Thanks, everybody.